I, I forget. It's, it's it the New Mutants or just New Mutants? Do you know, Charlie? It is the the however you say that word. Okay. The New Mutants. The New Mutants. Not just if you want to go not there, just any. Know. Yeah, not just any New Mutants, right? Like these the are the New Mutants. Yeah. Um, this is the long awaited, you know, as Charlie, you refer to this film as it's like your white whale. It's a film we never oh, thought yeah. would ever happen. Uh, we've been hearing about this movie for about four and a half years now. It, uh, was always sort of billed as let's, you know, they, you know, they were in the middle of making things like Logan and they had just come out with like Deadpool. And the idea was let's keep this train going. We're, we're making these like X-Men sort of like spin off standalone films that play with other genres. Deadpool was kind of this absurdist comedy, R-rated, of course. Logan was like an R-rated, like Western. New Mutants was going to be like their horror film, but kind of mixed with YA, which is why they brought on Josh Boone. Josh Boone's the director of the Fallen Our Stars, which had just come out a couple of years before they started production on this one. And as a concept, I think we were all pretty excited about this. I mean, I know I was. I was like, yes, the New Mutants is like an X-Men variant from the 80s in terms of the comics. We haven't really seen them come alive on screen, uh, it's at least not live action. And these are some interesting characters. Uh, you know, they have like ties, of course, to the main X-Men, but it was an exciting prospect of like, we're going to get something kind of in the vein of Deadpool and Logan that's trying something different with superhero movies. But the problem is that just things kept happening to delay this film for a while. Uh, it looked like Fox was playing around with the idea of doing reshoots. Those never came to be. But by the time they were gearing up for, you know, they'd already delayed it and it was going to come out in, in uh, you know, around like April 2018, something like that, about uh, a year after they were filming it. Then, uh, you know, Disney was like, hold on. <laughs> we uh we have some plans for you fox and because of the disney fox merger a lot of this stuff really just started getting it got pushed it got delayed we thought it was going to come out last year it didn't and a lot of people were like well you know what this seems like the kind of thing where it's not dark phoenix which came out last summer it's not something that's probably going to do super well in theaters because people are kind of over the x-men franchise now that there's like this promise of it being an MCU thing. People are like, oh yeah, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going to reboot all of this. So maybe this doesn't belong in theaters. The problem is Disney still had to put it in theaters contractually. We talked about this on the show before, but they would have lost a lot of money due to like legal issues. And there, there are still a lot of laws in place when it comes to what theaters can, or what theaters have to play or what studios have to play through theaters based on the contracts they do with production crews. So New Mutants had to be a theatrical thing. So we were going to get it this year. And then coronavirus was like, well, that's cute that you think this is going to happen. Um, sorry, but uh, theaters are now closed indefinitely. And here we are in August, uh, the, the, the very end of August. And Disney's finally like, you know what? We're going to put this out in theaters anyway. We don't care what anybody says. We're going to put it in theaters. And even though it's still pretty dangerous to do so, fine. It can also be in drive-ins. So if you, if you feel like uh, not risking your life for this movie, you can do that. And uh, we're going to have to say at the top of the show here, please do not see this at a movie theater if you are in the United States. Now, I understand in a lot of other countries, you have the virus under control. Places like, uh, I want to say like Australia, and then, you know, I, I don't want to say anything too, you know, ahead of myself here because I'm not in those countries. I don't know what the situation is. But if the coronavirus cases are down in your country and it is safe to do so, by all means, we have plenty of listeners overseas who can check this out in a theater. You, obviously, you you know the risks in your own particular area, but in the United States, no. Like people should not be going to theaters right now. We still lead the world in coronavirus cases. Uh, we, this is still very much a thing here, and you know it couldn't just. It's not just something that could harm you. It could harm somebody you care about if you come into contact with them. So we are we are talking about this film. However, we you know I didn't see this in a theater. I saw this at a drive-in. Drive-ins, of course, are a perfectly acceptable way to to watch something like this theatrically because it's the only way you can see it um, i believe it's it's a perfectly acceptable way to do so if you're you're being safe you're wearing your mask you're socially distancing and everything like that by all means go enjoy the new mutants but uh it's cinemaholics no we we do not we do not encourage anybody to be going to a theater right now please do not do that uh, that is just a terrible idea i don't care if your state has them open uh this is still very much of a thing that can really make things worse. And uh, we, we don't want movies to be the cause of that. We don't want to prolong this problem. We want theaters to open up the right way as soon as possible. That's not going to happen if we do it too soon. We've already seen this 
bear out how many times. So that that's our stance as a, as a Cinemahawks team. And so that's why we're, we're trying to tread pretty cautiously with all of this, all of this stuff right now. So New Mutants, saw it at a drive-in, but you know, Charlie, I kind of teased this earlier that this is something you've been really looking forward to just, just to see, is this really going to happen? Um, so kind of give us the rundown, you know, what's your story with this movie? And then if you can just kind of quickly tell us what, what's the, what's the setup here? Who's in this movie? What are we watching? Uh, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's talk about New Mutants. Okay. So this was the, like you said, the final Fox uh, X-Men film, and it was made around uh, the same time as Dark Phoenix, uh, yeah, Dark Phoenix and uh, Deadpool two and a lot of that. Yeah. Um, Logan, it kind of was announced after, as Logan was being made. It was shot in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And, and so part of the reason this one meant so much to me is, is because I started working in this industry at the end in 2016, I got hired on full-time at comic at the end of 2016, a couple of months or a couple of weeks, I'm sorry, before I got married actually. So really a lot of my adult life and the things that matter, you know, have been in kind of condensed in these four years. And this is one of those that we were talking about when I started, you know, when I started working, we were talking about new mutants because it had already been announced and they were gearing up for production and it has now finally come out. So it's really spanned my entire career. And, you know, at first, like everybody, it was one of those, you know, Hey, there's a lot of reshoots. There were, there was conversations that they were going to add characters in these big reshoots. You know, they, they cast people like Maisie Williams as she was starting to blow up from Game of Thrones, uh, Anya Taylor Joy before she was, or when she was in Split. You know, they were, they were casting uh, Charlie Heaton right as the first season, right after the first season of Game of Thrones. Like they had, had gotten these, these young actors that were coming up um, and they were going to play these new mutants, which from, from the pages of Marvel Comics, uh, new mutants were kind of an offshoot of the X-Men and they were, you know, a younger team and they had different powers. And there's the biggest, most popular New Mutant story is the Demon Bear saga, which is what this film was going to follow. And it was going to eventually tie into the other X-Men stories, but it was mostly going to be kind of standalone and um, and build its own thing. Actually, I think Boone had a trilogy planned out for these characters. Yeah, there was going to be like a post credit sequence, but then he literally took it out. The second one was going to be take place mostly in Brazil at uh, Sunspot's home. Uh, and they had already, they actually had talked to uh, Antonio Banderas was going to be the villain of the second movie because he was going to play Roberto's dad and was going to be a kind of a villain character in, in the second film. So I'm kind of bummed we're never going to see Antonio Banderas in an X-Men movie. But Sam, yeah. Uh, Although glad to hear he uh, he's officially recovered from coronavirus. So yes. Some good news. There. Yes. We all love it. The Mask of Zorro is one of the greatest blockbuster films of all time. It's so. my favorite movie ever. Still saying that because that, so that's fun. another one I just watched this year for the first time. Oh, Charlie, welcome to the. Oh, family. it's amazing. Martin Campbell. I, I wish Green Lantern didn't happen because Martin Campbell is oh, a treasure. Of welcome, the welcome to the mission. We're glad to have Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So anyway, that was kind of the story of this movie, and, and what they did is they kind of wanted to take Breakfast Club meets a haunted house. Uh, asylum type thing and put it in the world of the X-Men. And so conceptually for me, that is such a great concept. It's all the things I love put into one thing. And there was, again, all these years of these production issues and rumors. And then when Disney bought Fox, they were just going to put it out as is. And Josh Boom is going to get his cut, which sounds like a great idea with all the Snyder nonsense happening. And, you know, he's going to get to do his version of the movie and it has come out and it exists. I'll, I'll, I'll kick it back to you for a minute because that's kind of where we're we're caught up. I mean, that, that's that's the story. It's hard to describe the story because there's really not a lot to it. These mutants it's small. don't it's a, know a lot about their yeah. powers and they get put in this hospital. I guess there is more to say about it. They, they get put in a hospital, what they think is a hospital. Um, and Dr. Uh, Reyes, who's played by Alice Braga, is yeah. supposedly helping them learn to control their powers. And things start happening that are out of their control. And they think that maybe the place that they're in is not there to help them very much. Yeah, yeah. I think and, and that's based on what at. I understand, they were they were kind of teasing that this was like, you know, supposed to be more in the Logan continuity, that there there's gonna be a connection between these kids and the like runaway kids. And were- there there very much is in this film without giving too much away. There is a big through, you know, a connective tissue through line with this and especially with Logan, but also with X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. There was those movies were all supposed to come out kind of within a year of each other. So or a year and a half or so. So they there was a lot of tissue there that would have brought them together. I, they were they were ultimately trying to set up Mr. Sinister as a big essentially as a Thanos of the X-Men films, trying to drop hints in different movies and kind of have him as a big bad for a lot of different X-Men characters to go up against eventually. That's Which the way it seems having watching this. Yeah. And Sinister is a great character. Uh, and I would love to see Sinister on screen. See, here's the thing here. Here's here's the thing that I want out of an X-Men movie. And this movie, I actually get some of that stuff. No Magneto. I love Magneto. I love Wolverine. Great characters. Lots of fun. 
I don't want to see them in these movies anymore for a while. Just give me a break. Like we've seen so much Magneto, so much Wolverine, plenty of Professor X. What I liked about this movie was that it was like totally new characters, way less continuity stuff, and really just more about like just tell an interesting story in the X-Men universe. And I think that's what it's trying to do. I think for the most part, it basically does that. I think this actually, this movie's all right. I, I, I honestly yeah. think it's, is it worth driving 35 to 40 minutes for me to go to the drive-in sitting in that line and kind of just like being uncomfortable in my car, wishing that everybody around me would just like stop moving around in their pickup trucks for like 10 seconds so I can enjoy this movie. Turn your headlights off too. If you have a second, that would be nice. I, I would have loved to see this at home. I would have loved to see this on my TV late at night. Watch it with the, you know, watch it with the fiance, you know, make some popcorn. Let's do it. Let's watch new music. It makes me so happy when you say fiance, John. I'm so happy for you. I'm so excited. Thanks, man. That's so great. You know, uh, I should, I should say, you know, she, uh, she, 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 uh, she's not here at the moment, but uh, I I won't let her know that she got name dropped this much. I don't want her to find out, but uh, (laughs) (laughs) I shouldn't say name dropped technically, but anyway, this is the kind of movie I would have enjoyed just watching at home. And so it does bug me a little bit that I had to watch it in a less optimal way. I don't think the drive-in experience, at least in my experience, has ever been that great. I, I don't think you get the best picture, or best audio quality. It's the, serviceable. The drive-in experience is is real. I've, I've been a couple times this summer through all this COVID stuff. And I really love the drive-in for watching movies that aren't brand new. Uh, there exactly. are some exceptions. Exactly. I think I think Bill and Ted would have been a great drive-in movie. Um, sure. But, you know, I mentioned E.T. Uh, I saw E.T for the first time is there's an et and back to the future double feature at a drive-in and that was such an incredible one too for me if it weren't for the fires we were actually going to watch uh indiana jones and uh temple of doom on, yeah. at the drive-in that that yeah. is a drive those movie. are great that, um, jaws. we had a we had a jurassic park jaws double feature here uh i another one for the first time was footloose i saw dirty dancing and footloose at the drive-in those are great great drive-in experiences new mutants is not i don't feel a great that, that movie was made to be in an enclosed space you know you're at home i yeah, did that's the movie but that it is a, it's a better experience to watch it in an enclosed space i would have preferred that been at home I, I I think it's there's not really an optimal way to watch it right now because it's not it's not like Tenet where you understand like yeah this is a theater movie again not encouraging going to a theater just that's the that's the kind of movie that's a theater movie even then Tenet is something I don't want to that's the only way I can watch it is in a drive-in right mm. I don't want to I don't want to see it on a drive-in screen I don't think the drive-in screen has as much right. detail just because of the, right. the mechanics of my particular area maybe some people yeah. have a drive-in setup that is much better than mine that's probably the case. But I, like, I Bill just and Ted, feel like it, waiting you know, in a way. The, the, t- the edits and the details in something like Bill and Ted aren't quite as important in a Tenet or the color in a New Mutants, you know, and that's a fun movie. That's just, it's just to, made to be fun. And we'll talk about that later. But that's a great driving yeah. movie. Let's talk about the movie itself. You know, this, we, we haven't talked about the story too much beyond, you know, a, a lot of this movie, as you mentioned, it is very Breakfast Club. Uh, you know, I'm not as caught up on New Mutants as a comic series, but I do like the conceit of it. It's like, let's hang out with these different mutants. And you know, we get, we're first were introduced to Danny Moonstar, who is a Cheyenne Native American. And her prologue, uh, as we're, we're sort of like, this is the first thing we see in the movie, is we see her sort of escaping um, something very destructive that has happened. And the next thing she knows, she's in this hospital and she meets all of these these, uh, these new mutants and she develops uh, an interesting relationship with Maisie, Will- Maisie Williams character who is known as Wolfsbane and what's interesting about this movie is it doesn't just overload you with here's each character and their power it's not a dossier <laughs> you know like we do get kind of a slow build we meet Anya Taylor-Joy's character uh, Ilyana Rasputin who is connected I, the movie doesn't touch on this too much but she is connected to Colossus I think she's like a sister or cousin or something like that she is Colossus' sister okay yeah so she and, and she a bunch of drafts of this movie had Colossus is appearing in the film well which i wish would happen because i'm i mean i'm glad <laughs> i does not but I also i'm I, I don't want that i'm just i'm i'm friends with the guy who plays Colossus, and i just love seeing him and stuff so shout oh, out okay. to that uh, makes sense stefan anyway continue hey you know if it's if it's for stefan i'm, I'm fine with yeah it. I, but, I got a name you know. job he's that, that that's that's like that's my boy that's my guy so anytime <laughs> he's in stuff you know I want it to happen. I can't say I'm friends with Anya Taylor Joy, but I can say that I believe that she is cheated here because I think that in a different X Men universe, this is the a star is born in terms of this. Character. And it's a perfect match for that character I and actor. Love like, this it's character. So good together. She's so the good. The dialogue she gets is the worst. Now, yes. So we mm. we got to we got to bring that up. 
this, it was hard to listen to. She's a bit of a bully in the early part of the movie. She, uh, there's racial slurs coming out of her mouth. Now we do get like tragic backstory stuff that's meant to like humanize her and everything like that. But it's still, you know, it's just like, man, you, you, I don't even, have to hate this she was character that much. It's that the insults were bad. They were just dumb, bad insults. It, it was confusing too with the puppet and they, they just, I don't know, they, they, they don't handle her as gracefully as they need to. And that is the biggest criticism I give this movie. Now, this is not a movie that I think is all that bad. I do think it's pretty enjoyable. It's only some pain points. The problem is it's edited down to the just bone. They took a movie that was clearly about like roughly two hours, maybe two hours and a few minutes, and they hacked it to pieces. And you can really tell when you're watching this and it's hard to appreciate the filmmaking because there are so many editing mistakes. There's so many pacing errors. Though the, there's, there's some big ADR mistakes. Connect. Oh my god. Oh, there's there's I, some blatant like it's some of the most noticeable I've like I've ever seen in terms of like See, I wasn't sure if that was the drive-in experience. Matching up. Oh no, it is not. It is not the drive-in experience. That was that was messed up, you know, and it's it, it's hard this it, it, ironically this movie needed reshoots. <laughs> I'm not even talking about to overhaul the whole story, but like most movies have reshoots and and they're cuz they're intended to clean things yeah, up. It's and too that's late, what this of course. needed. You know, like my, Macy Williams has grown up and like, you know, it's right. I think that like these care these actors have sort of moved on. But because the issue was they wanted to do all these reshoots initially and Fox wanted to really overhaul the film and the right. reshoots They're were going to take it. months. And so they waited to schedule reshoots because they were going to take such a chunk of time. And, and it's then, a low budget. So it would make right. sense for them to just redo the whole thing. Because so the then by that time, the more. Disney purchase happened. So they could not, they didn't schedule reshoots because Disney wasn't going right. to pay for that. And so even the regular reshoots just got cut at that point. And it really showed, you know, they, they have those moments where it's kind of messed up and they, they, you know, like you said, kind of getting hacked up. They didn't, none of the stories except for Daniel Moonstar were like, th- there was no finish. There was no ending. There was no arc to the rest of them. They, they, set up all these backstories and all these things they had to overcome. And at the end, they're just like, all right, here we are. And it really just skipped so much of it because of how this was edited and how, how little they had to, to work with essentially. There's certainly a version of this movie where it's not as predictable because the movie only gives you so much information. So it's really easy to piece together what the movie is and what the central mystery and why things are happening. So you're way ahead of the characters in that respect. I think a different version of this movie is no, you're in a lot of these other characters heads. You're seeing way more of Sunspot. You're seeing more of Cannonball and you're seeing more like you're able to be like, okay, anything could happen here. Like it's not as obvious (laughs) of a plot twist as this movie might make it out to be unfortunately that's just this is not the case now it doesn't mean the movie's not enjoyable enough i mean you really no, it, you fine. get stuff in here you get morsels of fun and some of the horror there's, stuff is more I, I, I will say there's a, there's a last about the last 20 minutes i didn't love the ending itself at the last like two three minutes of the film where like the actual ending yeah it's but cheesy. really the the third act is very good when they get to actually they play with horror stuff and they're doing their x-men powers like some of that stuff is gorgeous the demon bear design is fantastic the whole uh limbo where, cool, where magic yeah. kind of draw powers powers from um the way they animate cannonball like a lot of that is really good but it takes so long to get there and the stuff before it is not super interesting um you know but i i do appreciate that the best part of the film is towards the end and so you really leave with a more enjoyable experience um it's just it's inconsistent in its enjoyability and honestly i think that's my the toughest thing for me is that it is just you know like you said it's it's a fine film it, it's average and that's after all of this with new mutants after what this movie became yeah. like i mentioned you know my white whale like after the the legend of the new mutants all we have is this very average normal movie it's not great i i would have so much rather this been like a cat situation where it was just <laughs> so atrocious that we could I won't not go that stop talking about it. right I, I don't i don't wish for those movies to exist but after all this like i want something to talk about and this movie was just it just simply exists and there's the sort of feeling that like people thought this might be a new cult classic. I just, I don't think it's Mm-mm. weird it enough for it. that, you know, like it's not, it, and we should say like part of the reason it feels very average is because it doesn't do anything particularly inventive. It's easy to sort of sum up what they're going for here. Even with the horror stuff, it's all sort of just, you can tell they were heavily normal. inspired yeah. by the state, by the um, making of it. They were really like that movie was just oh, coming out. Especially when they were the this. ending. I've, yeah. It sucks that this movie came out after it chapter two. I don't want to spoil the film, but it chapter two had an ending that I very much hated. And I think I hated this one more because it was very much like that ending. And this came out second. Yeah. Even though this was made first, 
I won't get too into too much detail about that, but it's just yeah. it's so on the nose. It's it's you know it's very CW. Not that I dislike mm-hmm. the CW this, or anything. This but, movie you know. was a great TV pilot, and Josh Boone is more of a TV director most of the time. I think that this if they were if they were making a New Mutants TV series, this would have been a really good pilot yeah, to start. Strong off. start. I would have been, I I absolutely would have tuned in the next week to see what would happen. But on a big screen, especially in getting dumped in the pandemic, for me going to a theater that wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world. You know, I didn't mind only being a couple people there, but I still it's it's a weird feeling to be there and I, again it's it's to the point where i don't encourage anyone else to do it and to be there was like for this like this it's for this but i don't i don't think this deserves this you know it was it it just it's painfully average and you know i i'm glad it's finally out it just kind of feels like my world would change when this was over and there's nothing changing about it. i will say that if it, we're gonna like i wrote my review which you can find on comic.com i wrote about how the legend of of this movie, the legacy is what we're going to remember, you know, not the film itself. All of this film's legacy is going to be in its in its background about the troubled production, about never it, it rumors it was never going to come out, all this stuff. Um, but also from a social perspective, and, and it's like in this this social tug of war, which is so fascinating to me. On one hand, it's a big step backward. There is some serious whitewashing that happens in this movie, and a lot of people are very upset about it. And Josh Boone was asked about it, and he did not handle those answers very well. I think he's a good intention guy personally, but I, I, he, he did not answer those questions well at all or really help himself with how he answers these questions about, you know, Roberto is half black and, and he is a dark skin character in the comics and where he comes from. And that was pretty much ignored. And Dr. Reyes is the same way. And they cast Rosario Dawson to play her. And then she left the film and she was replaced with uh, Alice Braga. And, you know, two instances where these characters were given much lighter skin than their characters in the comic books. And so, that's a big issue for people, and I totally understand that. And so that's a re- that's a really big step backward. But on the other hand, this is also a comic book. This is a Marvel film that has a a lesbian love story front and center. It's not two background characters. It's not. It doesn't. It's not a throwaway plot device. It is central to the story and is a genuine connection between these two characters. And that's the first time we've ever seen that. So it, it's got kind of two sides of this tug of war, and it's going to be remembered for those things rather than what anything that happens in the movie itself. I do think it's kind of funny, though, as like a piece of trivia. It, it's almost kind of sad that a, this movie is probably the first time that like the main character is in like an LGBT love story. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, and, and what's sad about that is like TV is so far ahead of movies in this way. Like we've gotten so many, so many shows with superheroes where main characters are much more diverse they they ha- there's just so many different types of stories being told and it's just i don't know it's it's something that i don't think hollywood kind of understands as a just as a general entity of like how much appetite there is for like different stories being told in a way that it, that feels like natural and feels like you know not like they're doing it to for pandering not that they're doing it for points you know that's it's not like not they're doing it for like the end game thing where they can be like well look we we mentioned that a character might you know is is gay in a sentence you know but actually like crafting stories around different lived in and human experiences in a way that's universal in a way that you know allows people to connect with each other on just different types of levels and we're not going to look at new mutants as the pioneer of that. I mean, it's, it does it in a way that, like you said, it's a way that TV has been doing it for the longest time. So it's not very noteworthy in that respect. And, but I do agree that it, it is a welcome thing. And, you know, it, you mentioned the, you know, the whitewashing that happens in here. I mean, yeah, that's very much a thing. And I think, you know, Bob McLeod, uh, one of the co-creators uh, with Chris Claremont, you know, he was like, you know, I was excited about this idea. I was like, yeah, it's, you know, take new mutants and turn into a horror thing. That's fun. And then he was like, I can't believe they spelled my name wrong in the credits. Like they didn't have the, just the care to do a quick Google search to make sure that this guy's name is spelled right. And that's a kind of disrespect that I think, yeah, they just rush this thing out the door because they had to which is ironic because it was on the shelf for four years and you know it was in in some kind of production for four years and it's it's it feels so rushed like it's that amount of irony is just it's one thing if it's just complete like doolittle was a situation where it was so overdone by the time it came out like it, there were so many things that were done too much they kept making different decisions and adding on top of it so they got something that was just a total mess and this was the exact opposite like it was sitting around forever and they just weren't allowed to do anything with it so when the time it came out it's like we have this orig- original thing we made and we were rushed because we didn't have all this other stuff and it is what it is you know it's it's kind of it's kind of a shame to see what what was a truly great idea i think end up whether by fault of a filmmaker or by a studio issue whatever kind of become just this 
it's not the worst movie ever. You know, I, it's better than a lot of the other X-Men movies, which says a lot about that franchise as a whole. But, you know, it just it is. Let's get into our final thoughts here. And that, that's my final thought is that, no, it's not the worst X-Men movie. I, I know there, were, there was some discussion about that online of like, yeah, this is the worst one. Come on. No. Dark Phoenix, in my opinion, uh, by far. See, I, Dark Phoenix, I felt a lot like this one. I was like, Dark Phoenix was fine. I didn't have any issue with it. It wasn't good, but I didn't bother me. You know, there's some like X-Men Wolverine that are Origins Wolverine that are just so incredibly bad. Like, you know, see, I don't, I don't you like you that. You talk about cats level disasters. Like that's what that looks like for me. I um, disagree. Kind of. I, I, I honestly, mean, you, you take, you take Deadpool, who is the most, like the character known for talking and you seal his yeah, mouth shut yeah. in the first. I get the it. Film. I get it. But you know, aside from that, I, I, I honestly don't think that film's nearly as bad as it gets some credit, you know, Lack the point is, X Men yeah. franchise had a lot of stinkers, and for sure, for sure, not many truly great films. This one's close to the bottom, but it's definitely not. It's definitely know, not the it's, bottom. It's in the for sure. it's in the low middle. I, I, this is a C plus for me, very low C plus. It's, it's almost a C, but I do think there are a couple things here that I do think are enjoyable enough, and I, I genuinely think some people are going to watch this and be like, "This is a lot better," because their expectations will be so low. So my thing is like, if your expectations are pretty low, but you still have a little bit of curiosity, for sure, go check it out. You know, like it, if it's at the drive-in or just wait for yeah, it. I mean, to I'm, be, I'm uh, definitely going to watch it again when it comes out at home. Like I, I'm, I, I'm, I was will. intrigued by it because I want to watch all that Demon Bear stuff again. I, that that final act to me is going to be worth renting it on digital. You know, like that's I'm going to I'm going to be excited to, to see that part again and see that stuff. And, you know, but overall, I mean, I, I'm with you. I, I, I give it a C. I was a little bit lower, but, you know, it's. It's the most average you can get with stuff. It's got good. It's got bad. Don't go to a theater and watch it right now, for sure. C for Cannonball, because Cannonball is average. Oh, and that's I just say that one thing. I'm so sorry, because uh, I, I want to move on from this. But S- Charlie Heaton is a great actor, as we've seen in Stranger Things. That accent that Cannonball has is one of the worst things I've ever heard. Yeah, it's not great. He's supposed to be from <laughs> Kentucky, and it sounds like on a sketch comedy show where they're trying to make fun of Southern accents. That's what his accent sounds right, like. Right, yeah. I thought he was very, very bad. It's like they brought him on for Black Jeopardy or something. It wasn't quite so uh, wasn't quite there. So bad. I feel like Captain Ahab. I am very <laughs> let down and do not feel fulfilled by uh, by the uh, the capture of my white whale. 